You're watching Economics Amplified, the latest thinking on the biggest issues from UChicago's Becker Friedman Institute. It's my pleasure to be here on behalf of the Becker Friedman Institute to introduce today's speaker and welcome you to the first Becker Brown Bag Lecture of the 2015-2016 academic year. The Becker Brown Bag series was created to provide a lunchtime setting where prominent economists can present their research and engage MBA students in discussion. In fact, the inaugural speaker nearly nine years ago was the namesake of the brown bag, Gary Becker. The essence of Gary's research was Chicago price theory, which treats economics not as something that exists only on the blackboard, but as a powerful tool that can explain the world, having no limits on the topics. Crime and punishment, education, migration, motherhood, racial inequality, all of them fall within the topics of Chicago price theory. That's why it's so fitting that today we have as our speaker, Jeff Groger, the Irving Harris Professor in Urban Policy at the Chicago Harris School, who has worked on exactly these issues. Professor Groger is an applied microeconomist and a leading expert on welfare reform in the US. Today, we're lucky to have him talk about his current research on the response of prices to a soda tax passed in Mexico that was meant to combat obesity. Personally, I look forward to hearing what he has to say. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Groger. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I guess I wanna start by saying a couple things. So this is some work that is quite recent. In fact, one could call it preliminary. Um, and what that means is some of the numbers I'm gonna talk about may change, uh, but it also means this is an opportune time for comments uh, because I'm actually about to write this up. Okay, so let's talk about, so why soda taxes? The real issue here is widespread obesity. And to give some context from the American perspective, uh, the short fact of the matter is Americans are heavy. Uh, adults, among adults, 69% are overweight. That means they have a body mass index of 25 or higher. 36% uh, are obese, meaning their body mass index is 30 or greater. Now, in case body mass, body mass index is not something familiar to you, Take your weight in kilograms, divide that by the square of your height in meters, that's your body mass index. Okay, so uh, the, the common threshold for, for uh, overweight is 25 and uh, for, uh, for obese is 30. Now, when we talk about children, we measure obesity, overweight and obesity differently. We measure it with respect to growth tables, but we still see a troubling, there's sort of a couple of troubling facts, and that is there's a lot of overweight and there's a lot of obesity among children. So among kids, almost a third are overweight, 17% uh, are obese. So obesity is a, uh, a, very, a, a very prevalent problem, potentially a very important problem in the United States. Now, so you might ask, why is obesity an issue? Obesity is strongly linked to a number of chronic diseases, uh, including diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, as well as some types of cancer. And obesity is also costly as well, sort of in dollar and cents terms. Uh, it, it's been estimated to have accounted for $170 billion of US health expenditures in 2008, which amounts to roughly 5% of, uh, of health spending. Now, that said, obesity is not just an issue in the United States. So this is a map from the World Health Organization. It shows the prevalence of obesity around the world. The darkest color here, the dark orange, uh, is for countries where 30% or more of the adult population is obese. Uh, so what we see here is we see the United States, we also see our neighbor to the south, Mexico, that we'll be talking more about. Uh, but we also see countries like Venezuela, South Africa, and a number of countries in the Middle East as well. And that's not just the extent of the obesity problem. If we look at the next darkest shade, that's sort of dark orange, this is for countries with 20 to 30% of the population, adult population uh, is obese. And here we see a lot of countries. So in the Western Hemisphere, we see Argentina, we see Chile. Uh, elsewhere, we see much of Western Europe, exceptions being France and Italy, uh, Russia, and Australia. So obesity is a very large problem. It's a very widespread problem. And uh, in most countries, it is growing rapidly. Okay, now, so one of those countries, as I alluded to, is Mexico. And I'm gonna focus on Mexico in this talk. Like Americans, Mexicans are very heavy. So about 73% of Mexican adults are overweight and about 33% are obese. So the BMI distribution in the United States and that in Mexico are fairly similar. Uh, as in the United States, obesity is very costly in Mexico. It's been estimated that uh, roughly 13% of Mexican health expenditures in 2008 were devoted to obesity and its, uh, and, its, and its related diseases. Those costs have been projected to double by 2017 
And one of the particularly troubling things about Mexico is that much diabetes in Mexico, which is sort of a, a, a primary a cause, primarily caused by obesity, much diabetes is uncontrolled. So given a certain rate of diabetes, the costs in terms of human welfare and in terms of the medical costs are likely to be larger in Mexico than they would be, uh, say, in the United States. OK, so what causes obesity? Well, in general, there's this equation, right, which says that um, you gain weight if you consume too many calories and you don't expend enough. OK, now, given that, there's a strong link between obesity and sugar consumption. And drinks with added sugar are sort of a major problem in this equation. Now, why is that? There are a couple things about drinks with added sugar. First off, they're high in calories. The typical 12 ounce can of soda has about 150 calories. Uh, so at the same time that they're high in calories, they're also low in satiety. And that just means that after you've had a soda, you don't feel very full. So another way to think about this, the difference between 150 calories of soda and 150 calories of ice cream, clearly both were 150 calories, at least 150 calories of ice cream fills you up somewhat. So whereas those 150 calories of ice cream might displace calories, other, some other calories that you would, that you would otherwise eat, uh, that's rarely the case for, for sugary beverages. Okay, so, uh, and what this means is there really doesn't seem to be much displacement of calories consumed in the form of sugary beverages, rather they just add to the total. Okay, so, the other thing about Mexico is Mexicans really love drinks with added sugar. So as an aside, Mexico is the only place I've ever been where you can buy on the shelf at the grocery store orange juice with added sugar. I don't know, I've never seen that in the United States. But so Mexicans have a sweet tooth. Uh, with respect to sodas, uh, it's been estimated that they, they drink on average 139 liters per person per year. That translates to an average of just over one can per person per day. Um, drinks with, sugar, with added sugar in general have been estimated to account for something like 20% of the adult energy intake in Mexico. So these drinks with added sugar uh, make up a lot of the, uh, uh, the calorie content, the calorie intake of your typical Mexican. Now, I should say, I, I shouldn't single out Mexicans here. Mexicans love their drinks with added sugar, but if you look at the other countries, uh, the United States, Argentina, Chileans, uh, they're pretty high up there too. So those are the other three countries with the highest uh, per capita soda consumption. So Mexico's solution to this, the obesity problem, has been something called the National Strategy to Prevent and Control Overweight, Obesity, and Diabetes. And this national strategy has a number of, a number of points. It calls for a number of measures, one of which involves restrictions on advertising that is directed to children. And another, and the one that I want to talk about today, involves uh, taxes on junk food, I won't talk about today, but taxes on drinks with added sugar. Okay, so taxes are part of the, uh, the Mexico's overall strategy for dealing with obesity and its, and its consequences. Okay, so what can we say about Mexico's drinks with, uh, tax on drinks with added sugar? It took effect on January 1st, 2014. It applies to all drinks to which sugar has been added. Okay, and so what does this mean? Oh, the tax itself is one peso per liter. So the average price of soda just before the tax took effect was about 11 pesos per liter. So think about this as roughly a 9% tax. Uh, the tax applies to regular sodas. It applies to fruit juice drinks. It applies to water drinks with added sugar. It does not apply to uh, milk or any dairy product, and it does not apply to pure juices. Okay, so basically if you add sugar, the language actually says something like if, if, the, if the drink involves dissolving sugar in water, it's taxed, otherwise it's not. Okay, now, why a, tax, so why a tax on soda to combat obesity? So the economic theory here is pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Uh, the tax should raise prices. Higher prices should reduce consumption. And lower consumption should mean lower weight. And uh, by extension, lower rates of chronic disease. Okay, so this is a pretty straightforward application of price theory. Um, it tells us what, what we should expect in terms of the direction Right, that this is, this is something that should at least uh, get people to curtail their consumption. But it doesn't tell us how much. And how much is really a critical question for sort of any sort of cost-benefit analyses of the policy. Okay, so, uh, so there are two key, key questions that are not addressed by uh, the theory. The first is, how much do prices rise? Right? Do they rise by a little? Do they rise by a lot? And the second question is, what happens if consumers substitute away from drinks with added sugar towards other caloric beverages? So and the problem here is, if consumers merely substitute away from sodas toward orange juice, for example, I mean, the, the nutritional content of orange juice is clearly higher than that of soda, but the caloric content is basically the same. So if what we find is something that looks like one-for-one -one switching between sodas and orange juice or even sodas and milk, we wouldn't expect much weight loss. 
Okay, so these are a couple of questions about which theory by itself is silent, uh, and we want to take that to the data. Okay, so the, the two questions, the first question that I try to address in this work is, how much do prices rise in response to the tax? Um, and this is called pass-through. So for every one peso increase in price, or excuse me, for every one peso increase in tax, what is the increase in price? Um, you know, according to straightforward textbook theory, pass-through is going to depend on market structure and it's going to depend on the shape of the demand curve, not just the elasticity. And depending on the market structure, depending on the shape of the demand curve, prices could either rise by less, by the same, or by more than the amount of the tax. Right? So theory doesn't tell us anything about the quantitative change. Another way to say this is that the pass-through that I'm going to try to estimate is a key parameter into sort of evaluating and predicting uh, the effects of the, of the policy. Okay, so that's question number one. The other question is, what do consumers drink instead of tax beverages? And as I said, depending on substitution, you could have either more or less favorable prospects for weight loss. Now, so here's the problem. All, I, all I'm dealing with is price data. I don't have any data on consumption. We can talk about that later if we have time. So what I have data is data on prices. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply some basic consumer demand theory, and <clears throat> I'm going to try to infer how people are substituting away from sodas by looking at the prices of potential substitute drinks. Right? Because what basic consumer theory tells us is that if there is increased demand for these substitute drinks as a result from shifting away from the sodas, then I should see an increase in the price of those drinks. And so, um, in a nutshell, substitution patterns may be revealed by price changes. So that's what I'm going to be looking at as well. Now, once I have done that, once I estimate the pass-through for sodas, estimate pass-through for potential substitute products, then what I'm going to do is try to make some very rough estimates uh, as to the effect of tax on consumption and on weight. Okay, and so I want, to, I want to talk about all of this. Okay, now, it turns out that estimating pass-through poses a very thorny evaluation issue. And the reason is because the tax was imposed across the entire country all at the same time. Okay, so normally in a research setting, what do we like? We like to have a treatment group and we like to have a control group. So something that would have been ideal in this case would have been if the Mexican government had imposed the tax in certain cities, maybe certain states, and not imposed the tax in other cities. I would have had a group of treatment cities, I would have had a group of control cities, and I could have estimated the effect of the tax on price by comparing the change in prices across those two different groups. Well, they didn't consult me when they decided on their rollout plan. So I don't have that to work with. What I have is one tax that was imposed all at the same time, so I don't have a control group in the customary sense. Okay, so what am I gonna do? Well, what I do have here is I have control products. Okay, so there's one product, set of products, drinks with added sugar, that were taxed at the beginning of 2014. There are any number of products that were not taxed at the beginning of 2014. So I'm going to use drinks with added sugar, and specifically I'm going to use regular sodas as my treatment commodity, and I'm going to use approximately 120 other uh, products for which price indexes are available as comparison commodities. And essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a couple of different methods that I'll talk about more in, a, in order to compare the trajectories of the treatment and control products before and after the, the tax was put in place. Okay, so that's the idea. I don't, have my, I don't have a conventional treatment control group strategy available to me, but I can think about, I can think about uh, treatment and control products. At this point, let's take a look from the data. Let me tell you where the data comes from. It comes from the survey that is used to estimate the Mexican Consumer Price Index. Okay, so just as we have a consumer price index here, that's, that's the thing that tells us about the rate of inflation every month. Uh, in Mexico, they also have a consumer price index. Uh, it is an ongoing survey. It covers 283 product categories and involves the collection of price data for 235,000 items each month from 46 cities nationwide. So this is a pretty comprehensive survey. So sodas, for example, are just one of those 283 product categories. Now, the public use data, actually Mexico provides much more useful public use data than is provided by the United States. And what do I mean by that? They don't give me the individual transaction price, but they give me something that's, 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 that's very useful and very, uh, what's the term, granular, okay? Because what I can get from, from Mexico is I can get the average price of each product in each city in each month. Okay, so it comes in standardized units, which is very helpful. So for sodas, everything is on a per liter basis. And it's really detailed. So for example, one of my observations will tell me what is the liter price of Coca-Cola 
purchased in a six pack of 355 milliliter cans in Mexico City in January 2015. Okay, and it turns out that the liter price of that product is 22.77 pesos on average. Okay, so it's the detail, the, the, the data here is pretty detailed. Now, it's fun to take a first look at the data. And so here what I have done is I have plotted sort of the nominal price index for sodas. This mix is regular and diet. I'll come back to this. Uh, for the period from 2005 until just past the beginning of 2015. And so what we see is a fairly steady increase over the period from, 20, from 2005 to uh, as it happens right here. That happens to be December 2013, the month before the tax took effect. And then we see a great big jump. Here's January, here's February of 2014, right as the tax took effect. And then we see the, uh, price, the, the price index continue to rise pretty much. This, 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 as it turns out, is pretty much the rate of inflation. Uh, so prices went back to rising at about the rate of inflation. So you know, there's a prima facie case just looking at the data that the soda tax had a pretty big effect on price. Right? One question is going to be, you know, how big was this effect and relative to what? Right, relative to some counterfactual that reflects uh, what prices, how prices would have evolved had the tax not been imposed. I don't know about you all, but when I first saw this graph, I got really excited about this project. <laughs> uh, I've been in this business for a while, and I don't know, the number of times I've seen something like that, I could probably count on one hand. Okay, now, so in terms of product categories, so remember what I'm interested in, so I have one taxed good, which is regular sodas, and then I'm going to have other potential substitutes. Now, it turns out that the product categories in the price index are take the form of soft drinks, bottled water, juices and juice drinks, and milk. Those are the beverage, those are the beverage categories in the Mexican Consumer Price Index. Now, within each of those categories, it turns out there was a mix of taxed and untaxed product. So what I did, I took apart the price indexes, and then I recombined them so as to have uh, the tax product, regular sodas, in one category, and then I think I have five other comparison products. So my comparison product is going to be diet sodas, water drinks without sugar, milk, and pure juice. Right? So the idea is we're expecting to see a direct effect of the tax on regular sodas. And then a the question is, what happens to the prices of these other goods with the idea that if people are substituting towards those other goods, we will see price increases there. All right, so that's sort of the story. Now, I'm going to take two empirical approaches here. One is called the synthetic cohort approach. One has a whole bunch of names. It's called intervention analysis, interrupted time series, uh, and so on. So let's talk about those two methods. Uh, and I'm not, gonna, I, I, I'm not planning to go into a lot of technical detail here, but I, think you could, but I think the idea here is easy enough to convey. So the synthetic cohort approach does the following. It looks at all of the 120 comparison goods, the control goods, and it assigns weights to those goods, positive weights that sum to one, so as to construct a synthetic comparison product, an untaxed synthetic comparison product that most closely tracks the pre-tax pre tra pre trajectory of regular sodas. Okay, Then I'm going to take that synthetic cohort, I'm going to extrapolate the price of that thing into the future, and that's going to be my estimate of the counterfactual. That's going to be my estimate of how would the question, you know, it's going to be my answer to the question, how would the prices of sodas have evolved after January of 2014 if the tax had not been put in place? Okay, so that's, that's approach number one, the synthetic cohort approach. What about the second approach? This is, again, this is called inter intervention analysis, interrupted time series. If you've had a class in time series, this will be a pretty quick, uh, pretty quick explanation. The idea is this, you fit a time series model, sometimes known as an ARIMA model, to the pre-tax data. Then, conceptually, if not literally, you take that ARIMA model and you forecast what the price would have been of sodas in the event that the tax had not been imposed. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the difference, conceptually, I'm going to use the difference between the actual and the forecast to estimate the level shift that was induced by the tax. Okay, so in both cases, there's essentially, there's conceptually, if not literally, essentially what I'm doing is I'm constructing a forecast of what would have happened if the tax had not been imposed, and I'm going to compare that forecast to what actually happened, and that's going to be the basis for my estimate, the estimate of pass-through. Now, 
Let me talk just a minute about this thing here. So I'm going to use permutation methods for inference. What does that mean? So in my view, it's a little tricky. So these ARIMA models come with things with standard errors, sort of conventional test of precision, significance tests. Those standard errors, that method of inference is basically designed to deal with sampling error. Now, if I'm averaging over, it doesn't have to be all 235,000 products. If I'm averaging over thousands of observations, how much am I really worried about sampling error? Maybe not so much. At the same time, what should I be worried about? What is it that really is going to contribute to uncertainty about the true value of the pass-through parameters that I'm trying to estimate? Well, it's going to be uncertainty about the model, right? Because remember, and that's the comparison model. In the synthetic cohort approach, there is an algorithm that tells me which convex combination of those comparison products makes the best synthetic comparison product, right? The best linear combination. But that's one estimate. I don't know that thing. There's a lot of uncertainty about the exact, what the model ought to be. In the case of ARIMA, I don't know if any of you have fit ARIMA models by hand, but there's art to this as well as science. You and I may look at the same data. We may have similar experience, and we may come up with different models. Now, in many cases, we're fortunate. Those models don't really affect, don't affect our conclusions, but in some cases, maybe they do. And so I would argue that in the case of this, this interrupted time series analysis, the standard errors that focus on sampling error are probably going to overstate the precision of your estimate of pass-through. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use permutation methods. And in a nutshell, what this means is I'm going to apply both of these methods separately to every price series in my sample, all of the comparison goods. And I'm going to estimate the treatment effect of the tax on all those comparison goods. Now, we think it ought to be zero, but we know that in a sample it won't be, right? Some are going to be negative, some are going to be positive. But when I'm done with that, I'm going to have a distribution of pass-through parameters, which seems like a reasonable approximation to the distribution of the pass-through parameter I'm trying to estimate under the null of no effect. And then what I'm going to do, since I have like 120 of those, I can basically just say where in that distribution of, let's call them pseudo-treatment effects for the untaxed products, my actual treatment effects lie. Okay, I think this provides a much more reasonable notion of uh, uncertainty due to the modeling environment than the conventional conventional approaches to inference. I should say that's not original to me, but I think it's a, I think it, it, it's very fitting here. Okay, so let's take a look at the results. So here, what I have depicted. So I'm going to look at everything. I'm going to deflate everything, put everything in real terms. So on this graph, what we're looking at is real regular soda prices. That's in blue from the beginning of 2011 till I think this is the sixth month of, uh, I think this is June of 2015. And so this is just a deflated version of what we looked at before. There's the big jump that we saw before. Deflating doesn't do anything to that. But I think what this graph does is it gives you sort of a, a, a visual sense of where the estimated pass-through is going to come from. The red line here, this is the price trajectory that is estimated for the synthetic comparison good. Right? And for some reason, that suggests that the price of sodas would have fallen if it hadn't been for the tax. Now, on the other hand, the green series here, this is the, this is the forecast from the ARIMA model, from the, the best-fitting ARIMA model, and that suggests that real prices would have been roughly flat, not, aside from the seasonal pattern. So in both cases, conceptually if not literally, the estimated pass-through is going to come from the difference between one of these counterfactuals down here and the actual data up here. Okay, so let's see what that looks like. If we look at sodas, regular sodas, the product of interest, what this says is that, oh, and then I've scaled this in such a way that we can read these numbers as the percentage change in the price relative to the price as of December 2013, okay? So what this says is, if we look at the synthetic cohort approach, that suggests that the 9% tax led to a 14% increase in the price. The ARIMA approach, the interrupted time series approach says that that 9% tax led to about a 12% increase in the price. Both of these involve what's called overshifting. The price increase was greater than the tax increase. So that's consistent with a model of substantial uh, market power. And considering that Coca-Cola has 70% of the market for soft drinks in Mexico, that seems like a reasonable, a reasonable starting point. So pretty big increases in prices as responses to the tax. Now, what are these numbers? These numbers here are the share 
of all those pseudo treatment effects that I estimated that are less than my estimated pass through. Okay? So what this number, so what this says is this estimate would be significant at the 6% level, this estimate would be significant at the 4% level. Okay, so these estimated treatment effects are way out of line with what we, would, what we would expect if the tax had no effect, right? So we would call these things significant. Now, what about the potential substitute goods? Diet sodas, water drinks, milk, and pure juices. If we look at diet sodas, we see positive numbers, all right, which is at least, you know, conceptually con consistent with some, uh, with some substitution. Although these numbers are much smaller than the pass-through numbers estimated for regular sodas, and they're not going to be significant at any conventional level. As we go to water drinks, milk, and pure juices, we see the same story. If anything, it's even stronger. These numbers, these estimated effects, are very small, and none of them are even remotely significant. Okay, so what's the conclusion from this part of the analysis? The conclusion is the tax raised price of regular sodas, the tax increase was about 9%, pass-through was 12 to 14%, depending on which set of estimates you like. So and again, this is consistent with theory of incidence in an imperfectly competitive industry. And for use later on, the 12% increase corresponds to a price increase of 1.32 pesos. The 14% increase corresponds to a, uh, an increase of 1.54 pesos. So the one peso tax increased uh, uh, the price of sodas by somewhere between 1.32 and 1.54 pesos. Now, what about other drinks? There's no price increases. One way to interpret this is there's no evidence that consumers substituted towards other caloric drinks. There may be other, subs there may be other uh, um, interpretations of that, but this one's going to be important for what I'm going to do next. Because what I'm going to do next is I'm going to take these pass-through numbers. I'm going to combine those with what we think we know about the elasticity of demand for sodas in Mexico. I'm going to use that. I think I have a slide that actually walks through this. Okay, so that's going to give me an estimate of the consumption response to the soda tax. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the caloric content of sodas and some standard energy calculations to estimate how the soda tax should affect weight in the Mexican population. All right, so that's the next step. Now, so it turns out that there's a range of estimates, both of the elasticity of demand for sodas as well as the consumption of sodas in Mexico. So these prior demand uh, elasticity estimates range from about minus 1 to about minus 1.3. So it's a range. It's a fairly tight range, but it's a range nevertheless. As for soda consumption, Euromonitor, which is a marketing research firm, uh, estimates that soda consumption in Mexico is 139 liters per person per year. That was in 2013. Now, what's really interesting is that once Mexico started collecting tax data, it became pretty easy to estimate soda consumption based on the tax, right? Because the tax is one peso per soda. Well, based on the Mexican Finance Ministry data, unfortunately, which is only available starting in 2014 as the tax started, consumption of sodas in Mexico is almost 163 liters per person. And so there's some disagreement there as to how much, how much soda uh, Mexicans consume. Nobody thinks they consume a small amount. Okay, but there is, some, there is some difference there. So what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to, want to, what I'm, going to, I'm going to want to present a range of estimates as to how the soda tax will affect consumption and weight. Uh, in order to make those weight estimates, I'm going to assume that the energy content of sodas is 400 calories per liter. This seems to be pretty uniform. Uh, and then the usual calculation to translate calories into pounds is uh, 3,500 extra calories, all else equal, translates into one more pound of body weight. All right, so... If you take these calculations, what do you get? Okay, so I have two panels here. So what we're looking at here is the change in liters consumed per person per year in response to the one peso tax. The top panel is based on an assumption that previous consumption was 139 liters per person. The bottom panel is based on the assumption of 163 liters per person. So this is the price increase that we get from the 12% pass-through number, this from the 14% pass-through number, and then we have two uh, demand elasticity estimates. So if we focus here, let, let, let's, let's take as the example, suppose that we believe that consumption was 139 liters per person. Suppose we think pass-through is 1.32 pesos and the demand elasticity is minus 1. We predict that liters per year, consumption per year would fall by 16 liters, 16.1. 
On the other hand, if we stuck with our initial consumption estimate, but we thought pass-through was 1.54 and we thought the demand elasticity was minus 1.3, we'd estimate the consumption would fall by 24.5 liters per year. Okay? Now, at the extreme here, if we go with 163 liters per year consumption number, pass-through of 1.54, demand elasticity of minus 1.3, we get 28.5 liter reduction uh, in consumption per person per year. Now, how does that translate into weight? So again, this is using the, 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 the sort of standard numbers that I, that I told you about a minute ago. Here, the weight loss predictions go from anywhere from minus 1.8 pounds to minus 3.3 pounds. Okay, now I, I know a lot of you at this moment are saying, what's the fuss? After all of that, you say people lose two to three pounds. That doesn't exactly sound like the result of a very successful diet, now does it? Okay, it's certainly not enough to eliminate obesity, which is some of the language in the, in the national strategy and so on. But Eliminating obesity may be not only realistic, unrealistic, it may not be necessary for substantial improvements in health and substantial reductions in health care costs. Why do I say that? There was a study recently by this organization called the Trust for America's Health that was based on a probabilistic simulation model of trajectories across weight states and across health states. So for example, they've got this model that has a sort of prediction of the rate at which people will move from being overweight to obese, from being obese to being diabetic, from being obese to having uh, heart disease, and so on, okay? Based on that model, it turns out that a 5.5% reduction in mean body mass index can have really substantial effects on health. So for example, they estimate that in response to a 5% reduction in mean BMI in the US, there would be 21% fewer new cases of type 2 diabetes, 8% fewer new cases of hypertension, and 8% fewer new cases of stroke or uh, coronary heart disease. So. All of this suggests that a 5% reduction in body mass may have important consequences for health. Now, there are also estimates for what that would mean in terms of U.S. healthcare costs. Now, I don't have those here. Why? Mexico is not the United States. Given the similarity in weight distributions between the two countries, it seems like these, these numbers may be relevant for the health consequences of weight loss in Mexico. But the health systems are sufficiently different. I'm not really, I'm not confident to, you know, sort of project differences, changes in health costs in Mexico based on numbers from the U.S. Okay, but nevertheless, even though Mexico is not the United States, it seems reasonable to think, you know, based on these numbers and the similarity of the BMI distribution across the two countries, that a 5% reduction in BMI in Mexico may have really important consequences for health. So the next question is, you know, how much weight would each Mexican have to lose to reduce mean body mass index by 5%? And the answer, if you play with the data from the Mexican um, Health and Nutrition Survey, is 7.9 pounds. So if every Mexican lost 7.9 pounds, uh, potentially there'd be substantial consequences on health, substantial reductions in chronic disease. Okay, now, 7.9 pounds doesn't sound like a small amount. But it doesn't sound like eliminating obesity either, does it? Okay, so the next question is, if we take those weight loss numbers that I just showed you, how large are those numbers in relation to the 7.9 pound target? Okay, well that's on, the next, that's on the next slide. And the answer is, under the most conservative assumption, that weight loss number is about one-fourth of that 7.9 pound target, the most optimistic assumption says that the soda tax should lead to weight reduction that makes up 41% of that 7.9 pound target. It doesn't get us all the way there, but pretty much regardless how you think about this, this calculation suggests that the soda tax could have a substantial impact on uh, 
Mexican weight, when we think about that weight impact relative to this 5% BMI target. Okay. Now, so what else? Okay. That's pretty much it for me, and then we'll take then we can take questions. So the conclusions. Uh, tax raised price of regular sodas, price of substitute goods didn't rise. If they had, that would have complicated those 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 calculations a lot. We would have had to factor in the caloric increase from, from the increase in uh, caloric goods. And depending on a number of assumptions, uh, these calculations say the soda tax may achieve something between 20 and 40 percent of this 5 percent reduction in BMI that seems to have uh, important health consequences. Okay, now, there's something I meant to say at the very beginning of the talk. Mexico is not alone in thinking about soda taxes as a, as a means to deal with obesity. Uh, Denmark has had soda taxes off and on. France imposed a soda tax a few years ago, and at the moment, the legislatures of countries as diverse as Colombia on the one hand and the United Kingdom on the other are actively considering soda taxes. Okay, so anyway, uh, this seems this this may well be the wave of the future, and uh, I'm happy to open it up. So this this um, calculated expected two to three pound weight loss per person per year. Um, well, per, per that person. is per year per person. Per year, but per person. No, steady state, per person. So th if that amount of, I mean, you calculated that based on, on not, the permanent not the permanent state of future caloric in intake of people, but based on one year's worth. No, but these are steady state calculations. So, that 35, so if, you, if you reduce your consumption by 3,500 calories today, yeah. then that will, that will result in a one pound reduction in weight. Right, and if you do the same thing again next year, that's another 3,500 calories. Yeah, but these are steady state calculations. That's a steady state calculation. I'm not seeing how that's possible. Everything I've read said that's a steady state calculation. But you, you've, you've calculated the number of calories that they're going to not be intaking over a year, which is 3,500 calories. So if they don't intake 3,500, if their change in consumption pattern leads to a 3,500 calorie decrease over the next year starting from the time that the tax is imposed, that 3,500 calorie decrease leads to one pound in weight loss. In steady state. So the reference for this yeah. is this paper by Cutler, Glazer, and Shapiro. Okay. Where it, it's, this is a steady state calculation. So this is a question I had. The best I can answer is that's a steady state calculation. There are questions. There are other questions about whether this that 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 number properly reflects metabolic changes that occur as you lose weight. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm not getting into that. But these are calculated as these are supposed to, these are supposed to be steady state calculations. My question is: Have you considered the impact of shifts in product mix within the soda category? Because uh, I mean, I know it's very useful to look at the data from uh, equivalized <coughs> units of per liter. Uh, but I know in Mexico, you know, they do a very good job of segmenting the market between lots of different package sizes. So, like, and obviously the smaller ones have a higher price per liter than the, the larger package sizes. So if people are paying more, are they just shifting to, you know, smaller consumption units uh, because it's less out of out, out of pocket cost? And have you considered that that could potentially raise the uh, the stated impact of the pass-through? So that would be, so basically this is a story whereby the effective price increase is greater because, because the units are smaller. And as you say, the price per liter is greater in smaller units. Um, I don't have any data on this. Uh, the, there are many people in the Mexican health ministry who believe that there are, that people are moving towards smaller, uh, smaller packages, but I have no information on that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it'd be interesting to, to see it's, it's not happening. It's not happening in the price series. I mean, the price series is a more or less fixed bundle. So there is, there's nothing in the price series that is. So none of the increase in the price series is reflecting changes in consumption towards smaller packages. It's sort of holding the package mix fixed. OK. All right. Thank you. So how, how do you think about the, the impact of this measure on different segments of the population, uh, considering that different people have different BMAs? BMIs? So this is all the calculation I do on average, 5% on average, but maybe this impact is higher 
in people with higher BMIs and lower. In, so, so how do you think about the final conclusions considering that the population is dissimilar? Uh, the way I think about this is I would love to have information on actual consumption uh, where you could actually address this question. All I have here, so all I have here are averages to work with. Uh, so I have, the, I have the price information, but then the elasticities and these other numbers that go into these calculations, uh, you know, basically those are just at the mean. Uh, the problem with the consumption data is that there are, I think I have four different sources of consumption data, and they all disagree wildly as to the level of consumption of soda in Mexico. Some of these things come from marketing surveys, some of these things come from um, household surveys, and some of these estimates come from like Euromonitor, this is an organization that just reports aggregates. So if I had what I thought was more reliable information on actual consumption of individuals, this is exactly one of the questions I'd like to get at. And the reason is that as uh, a, a lot of the most serious health consequences regarding obesity involve people who are way out on the tail. So people with BMI over 35, uh, not just over 30. Uh, so these are questions that I'd like to answer, but I just don't have, I don't have data that I'm confident at this point. Okay. Thanks. Regarding the data sets for the consumptions, I, I, I totally understand it's the lack of data that is um, causing you to rely on price as an estimate. Um, but have you, have by any chance there been um, efforts to, I guess, kind of get at the answer to how much consumption um, through benchmarking or trying to break down Pepsi or Coca-Cola's revenue since you already mentioned that they already have 70% market share in the soda industry. And these are companies that do pretty much water, juice, everything, right? So by breaking down their business, business models, um, the different business units revenues, you can pretty much get at how much the, the consumption has actually changed. I mean, if this is something that's not just relevant to Mexico, but say you were talking about other countries that were trying to enforce these kind of similar um, taxes, wouldn't there be a way for, I guess, governments to request these forms of data? I mean, it, it might be proprietary, but there is a way to, I guess, get at this uh, question of, oh, is there really a substitute effect going on if you just simply benchmark off of the leading companies that do already have over 70% market share. So, here, so here's the thing. So if you go to the Euromonitor database, which is actually available through the library here, uh, at a fairly uh, disaggregate level, you can, is it disaggregate enough to get company by company? Euromonitor will provide you its estimates of the sales of Coca-Cola, Pepsi, uh, and some of the, 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 the much smaller uh, producers in Mexico. Mm -hmm. They will give you some information about sales by brand. Okay, so it's possible to do some disaggregating there. Now, if you look at the non-soda drinks, I'm not sure what level of detail is available, but here's the thing. The two numbers that I gave you for consumption 2013, 2014, mm -hmm. differed a lot. So they differed by about uh, 20 liters per person. That was between Euromonitor and uh, the tax data. Now, ask yourself this. How is the tax data finding 20 liters per person more consumption than Euromonitor? Another way to put that is this. So I believe Euromonitor seems like a very credible organization. They seem to uh, take very seriously what they do. But at the same time, as soon as the tax data come out, it looks like they're really low. Now that said, everybody else is lower, and they're a lot lower. So if you just look at the Mexican Consumption Survey, you get their estimates of per capita consumption are about half. Uh, if you look at some of the other mark data from marketing firms, again, consumption looks like it's about half. Uh, part of this, you know, there's a story you can tell about what gets brought home, what doesn't get brought home. But there is this sort of fundamental discrepancy among all these sources. So, yeah, I, I don't really know how, how, how much success they're going to have trying to get the, get the real number. Mm -hmm. But that's in terms of absolute numbers. I'm talking about if we're trying to assess the substitute effect from, say, price increase in soda having substitute effect on orange juice, for example, it's really uh, the proportions, the shifts in proportions. And my, my, my assumption is that despite the fact that the absolute number is different in all, these, uh, all the four um, uh, sources that you mentioned, the proportion might have been pretty similar throughout consistent, assuming that they're really working on a very you know, like rational kind of way. So the proportion shouldn't have changed that much. Uh, um, and getting to that time when the tax was enforced, you could kind of uh, get an estimate of what the actual substitute was. I mean, instead of just relying on price as the estimate. Yeah, but the other point of view here is if there's so much discrepancy about the levels, why would you believe the shares? I'm just saying, like, if all four really, really had a similar proportion going in, I, I haven't looked at the data. 
then I might hazard that analysis. So in this study, you're looking at the effect of uh, tax on weight loss, right, essentially? Well, directly Potential on price. Potential weight loss, yeah. Directly right. on price. Yeah, directly on price. Um, have you looked at the angle where tax revenue uh, can actually be used to offset um, the effects, the opportunity and social and healthcare costs of, of, of the weight gain? Um, my example comes from my home country, Singapore, where cigarette prices have raised, um, they have risen about 300% in five years, uh, and demand hasn't dropped. And our minister justifies the, the increase in prices uh, because he says the revenue raise helps offset all smoking-related illnesses um, in our public health care system. So I was thinking that this might be another angle that the, Mexima, the Mexican government is actually looking at instead of just simply to seek uh, to reduce weight. So the plan was to use revenue, at least some of the revenue from the soda tax in order to install water fountains in all of the schools. There's evidence to suggest that that has not started. Uh, it's become pretty controversial. So clearly there was some thought given to it, but it doesn't seem like the action is following. If I understand correctly, one of the, um, the assumptions that you used to model the, the effect on demand of this price is assuming that the elasticity will remain the same as what it was historically. Uh, do you have any uh, uh, example of other countries where you have like quasi-monopolistic uh, uh, situations where this has been the case, although you had a like, step change in price? So, so the answer to that question is no. What is available, there are some studies of demand in Mexico that suggest that the demand, last, the demand has become more elastic over time. And the Mexicans love to tell this story that the reason soda consumption has gone up so high and correspondingly, obesity has risen so much, is because of NAFTA. Basically, we enter the, the, the you know, treaty with Mexico, we can flood the market with Coca-Cola, uh, and they can buy it at prices they never did before. Now, that sounds a little like conspiracy theory. However, um, it turns out that one way to rationalize an increasing demand elasticity over time is that market power within the market has increased. So if you think Coke has become a bigger player over time, that might be part of the story. Mm -hmm. I, that's not my story, that's a story. So I was just wondering um, why in, in one of your models, I believe it was the synthetic um, model, um, basically why, why did the soda prices were predicted to fall? Um, that seems like kind of a strange you know, event. I mean, I didn't look at the data obviously, but we did see sort of a general trend of, of inflation and that seems to go contrary to that. So it seems like an interesting phenomenon. Well, those are real prices, so it's not just a story about inflation. I, I, I don't know what the answer is. There's, there's a basically one of the goods is getting, that's getting a lot of weight was just sort of bouncing around seasonally for a while, right. but has decreased in real terms. So, and it's, yeah, that's so, not so a desirable feature of do, that approach. Do you not think that it, well, since that decrease starts at the exact point where you begin the prediction, could it be a consequence of, of the model somehow? Well, I mean, in some sense, it's coming right out of the model. Right. Because essentially, there was a product that seemed to be performing well in terms of tracking, that was getting a lot of weight, because it, it tracked well the price of soda during the, the pre-tax period. And then for whatever reason, it started falling. Okay. Yeah, I don't Thank know. You. And this is, this, is the, this is just one of the reasons why you want to present estimates right. from a couple of different methods. All right. Thank you very much.